A 14 foot bear and a 5 foot beaver are being rebuilt from Ice Age DNA. In Australia, scientists are trying to resurrect a frog that gave birth through its stomach. And in Texas, red wolves cloned from ghost DNA hiding in coyotes might be the last shot at saving a dying species. This is what happened when scientists tried to clone animals. After reviving dire wolves, Dallas based Colossal Biosciences is going even bigger. They've now set their sights on two massive ice. Ice Age animals, the short-faced bear, which stood about 14 feet tall and weighed over a ton, and Castorides, a beaver that was the size of a small person, meaning like five feet tall. Their plan is to basically take ancient DNA from fossils, find the genes that control things like size, metabolism, and bone structure, then plug those into modern animals. Grizzlies stand in for the bear, regular beavers for the mega beaver. They use CRISPR to do the editing, implant the embryos into surrogates, and hope the result looks and acts like the original Ice Age version. The idea is that these animals had very positive effects on the environment. They shaped rivers, moved seeds around, and cleared space for other species. Colossal's even working with indigenous groups to figure out how and where these creatures might fit back into the wild. Still, there are big unknowns. These animals disappeared over 10,000 years ago, so drop them into today's forests or waterways and honestly who knows what happens they could throw things off completely at worst or just not survive now over in Australia scientists have been trying to bring back one of the weirdest frogs I've ever heard of and I've talked about some weird frogs on the channel before now it's called the southern gastric brooding frog it went extinct in the early 80s but what was so strange about it well it swallowed its own eggs shut down its stomach acid and grew the babies inside of it then it would give birth by burping up its young that has to be one of the craziest birthing processes I've ever heard of. Since 2013, a team working on the Lazarus Project has been trying to bring it back using preserved tissue samples from the 70s. They took the nuclei from old cells and put them into eggs from a closely related species, the Baird frog. Now, a few embryos started developing. They reached an important stage called gastrulation, where the cells finally start folding into organs. Unfortunately, none made it to full tag but even getting that far was a huge deal. It proved that it's possible frozen cells from an extinct species can still form life. Now, according to project lead Dr. Mike Archer, the science isn't being held back by DNA damage, it's the technology. Frogs only lay eggs once a year, so there's a really small window to get it right. For now, they're kind of stuck with embryos that stop halfway, but even that's enough to show amphibian, you know, resurrection. It isn't completely unheard of. Now, if they can get past the early development stages, the next steps are growing live tadpoles and eventually froglets that can make their way back into streams. In April of 2025, Colossal Biosciences announced that they'd clone four red wolves using so-called ghost alleys found in coyote wolf hybrids along the Gulf Coast. Red wolves are critically endangered. There's less than about 20 left in the wild and just a few hundred in captivity and their gene pool is super shallow. What exactly are ghost allies though? Well, they're basically hidden bits of red wolf DNA that can still be found in coyotes, so Colossal extracted them, then used domestic dog surrogates to bring four new pups into the world. Now, these pups now live on the same Texas preserve than their dire wolf clones Colossals they created. Conservationalists call this a form of genetic rescue, so using a natural genetic variation to boost the health of a dying species. Critics say we still don't don't know how these clones will do in the wild, but everyone agrees this is a major step forward when it comes to conservation. Now, the Javan Batang is a type of wild cattle native to Southeast Asia. Their numbers have been dropping. Back in 2003, they were brought back thanks to cloning. Scientists used skin cells from a Batang that had died in 1980 and preserved in the San Diego Zoo's forest frozen zoo. Now, they transferred the nucleus from that skin cell into a domestic cow egg, implanted it into a pregnant cows and voila, a live benting calf was born on April 1st, 2003. A second calf followed two days later. Sadly, that one didn't make it. Now the first calf did pretty well though. It lived a full seven years before dying from a leg injury in 2010. So while not perfect, I mean, these early days of clothing were full of failures. It wasn't a short lived lab experiment either. This was a healthy breathing animal that helped preserve, you know, genetics that might have been lost forever. You could say it was sort of proof 
proof of concept. Now, scientists in Kashmir cloned a pashmina goat named Nori to help protect their famous Kashmir goats. These goats produce that super soft wool people pay really big money for, but these goats are slowly dying out because of habitat loss and climate problems. Now, the cloning process involved taking a skin cell from a healthy goat, putting its nucleus into an egg cell, and then implanting that into a surrogate goat. Nori was born healthy and is growing like any normal goat, still producing that prized cashmere. If this works long term, the same method could help protect other endangered species like the cashmere stag. I think the idea of cloning is often thought of as needless tampering just for the sake of it, but cases like this show it can really be a good thing. It can help keep animals from going extinct while also supporting the people who rely on them to survive. Now, China's been cloning animals way longer than most people realize. All the way back in 1963, they successfully cloned a common carp using nuclear transfer, a huge deal at the time. Now, cloning fish is trickier than mammals because of how they reproduce, but they pulled it off and it laid the groundwork for a lot of what came after. Since then, they've cloned other species too, like Mozambique, tilapia, brown rats, and even pigs. They were mainly trying to make fish farming more efficient and get a better handle on how these animals reproduce. By cloning fish, scientists could create more consistent breeding stock, which matters when you're, you know, feeding just millions of people, no big deal. It also opened the door for conserving endangered fish species later on. So while cloning tilapia didn't get the attention attention that say cloning a mammoth might, it was quite a big step. The Florina giant tortoise used to live in Florina Island in the Galapagos, but it was wiped out back in the 1800s, mostly thanks to whalers and pirates who used them as food and introduced invasive animals. But now scientists are bringing it back, not through cloning technology, but through smart breeding. In the early 2000s, researchers found tortoises on Isabella Island, about 50 miles away, with Florina DNA. Turns out sailors used to move tortoises between islands or just dump them off when they didn't need them anymore. These tortoises weren't 100% Florina, but some were pretty close. So scientists gathered, you know, the ones with the strongest genetic similarities and started a breeding program on Santa Cruz Island. As of 2025, they've got about 400 baby tortoises with high percentages of this Florina DNA. Now the plan is to release them back onto the island, but first they need to get rid of rats, cats, and other invasive animals that would basically just eat the babies. This matters because these tortoises are what scientists call ecosystem engineers. They stomp around, spread seeds, clear brush, and basically keep the environment in check. If all goes well, this will be one of the most successful island rewilding projects ever. Way back in 1952, two scientists named Robert Briggs and Thomas King pulled off something huge. They cloned a frog using a method called somatic nuclear transfer. Basically, they took the nucleus, the cell's control center from a normal frog cell and put it into an egg cell that had its own nucleus removed. That egg then started developing into a frog embryo. It wasn't a full animal clone, but it showed for the first time that you could take a mature cell, reset it, and grow a new organism from it. This was a massive breakthrough because it laid the groundwork for cloning animals later on. It proved that cloning could actually work. Plus, frogs are simpler to work with in the lab than mammals, so this gave scientists a practical way to explore cloning. And then about a decade after the first frog cloning, scientist John Gurdon came along. Instead of using embryonic cells like before, he took a fully specialized adult cell from a frog's intestine and transplanted its nucleus into an egg cell. The egg grew into a tadpole, proving that adult cells, even after they've kind of decided what you know they're supposed to be doing, and so to speak, still hold all the information in their DNA to create a whole new animal. Before this, most scientists thought once a cell, you know, specialized, it lost that ability. Now, Gurdon's experiment showed cells could be reprogrammed, which was huge for cloning. This discovery directly paved the way for cloning mammals, including Dolly the sheep, decades later. Now, without this experiment, cloning adult animals probably wouldn't have even been possible. In 2025, scientists put together a big review looking at cloning and conservation. They found that so far, 56 different species have been cloned using nuclear transfer techniques. Now, that's everything from mammals and amphibians to fish and insects, and about 90% of those cloned animals lived full, healthy lives. Plus, most of them ended up being able to have babies of their own.
own. Love that for them. That's huge. Cloning is actually making a difference in real world conservation. Scientists are using cloning to bring back genetic diversity in endangered species, revive species that are struggling, and we're on the brink of actually bringing back animals that went extinct a very long time ago. Cloning gives conservationists another tool in their toolbox, especially for species with tiny populations or ones that can't breed naturally anymore. The review also points out that the technology is getting more reliable and accessible, so cloning will probably play a bigger role going forward. So it's not a perfect fix, there are still some ethical dilemmas to deal with, but the results so far show that cloning can be a really positive thing for our future. You know, I mean, it can all go wrong. Either way, I'm sure to make videos about it. Mm -hmm.